Hi again, this is Andy, K4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and Lesson 32 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we go over the G9C questions. The G9C section of questions covers simply directional antennas. The, the three basic antenna types that this section covers is Yagi's, quads, and delta loop type antennas. And though this is a pretty simple section, there's not a lot of memorization that goes along with it. It is one of the longer ones with 21 questions. So the bad news is, is that it's a long section. The good news is it's a pretty simple section. So with that said, let's get started. Question one, how can the SWR bandwidth of a Yagi antenna be increased? The answer is to use larger diameter elements. And first of all, Yagi antenna is basically uh, in a, a directional antenna with three different elements, a driven element which is hooked to the feed line, a reflector element, and then uh, a directional element. And you can have more elements than that, especially with the directional elements, but the it, it, a Yagi antenna basically consists of those three elements. Now the other thing you need to know for this question is SWR bandwidth is essentially the spectrum of frequencies that an antenna can handle and still maintain a less than 2 to 1 SWR. So basically, if you change frequencies up and down the spectrum you, with this antenna, the SWR bandwidth is that spread of frequencies you can use, and the antenna will still have less than 2 to 1 SWR. Now, there are several things that impact an antenna, you know, whether it's a Yagi or otherwise, it, an antenna's SWR. And these things include such things as the material the antenna is made out of, the height above the ground, the length of the elements, and the element diameter. And this is complicated for why this is the case, but you don't need to know that for the exam. Now, the several answers on the exam will impact the SWR bandwidth of the Yagi, but the one that will increase the SWR bandwidth is increasing the diameter of the elements. What is the approximate length of the driven element of a Yagi antenna? The approximate length of a driven element of the egg antenna, or the element which is actually connected to the feed line, is roughly a one-half wave, wavelength, and this is the general rule. Now, like I said, there are three basic elements to a Yagi antenna, and that's the driven element, the reflector, and the, the director. And the direct, director element is pointed in the direction that you want your signal to go in. The reflector element is on the back end. It kind of reflects the signal back towards the driven element, and the driven element is in between the reflector and the director. So that driven element is got to be roughly one half wavelength for a Yagi antenna. Which statement about a three element single band Yagi antenna is true? The answer is the director is normally the shortest parasitic element. So of the three elements in a Yagi antenna, the director is shortest. Now, like I was saying earlier, there are basically, a Yagi antenna basically consists of three different types of elements. You've got the driven element, which is the powered element, is connected to the feed line. The reflector element, which is roughly 5% longer than the driven element, and reflects the signal back to the driven element. And the director elements, which are usually 5% shorter than the driven element. Well, in a three three band Yagi, the five the director element is five percent shorter than the driven element, and the director elements are responsible for focusing focusing the transmitted signal to and away from the driven element. Now, there there may be more than one director element in a Yagi antenna, all of them which become gradually shorter as the element gets farther away from the driven element. However, in a three element Yagi consisting of the reflector, the driven element, and the director element, the director element is the shortest. Also, this relationship with the elements is the same with all three antenna types we're going to talk about in this section, the Yagi, the quad, and the delta loop. Which statement about a Yagi antenna is true? Well, the true statement in the possible answers is that the reflector is normally the longest parasitic element. So, of on a Yagi antenna, the longest element is going to be the reflector. And this goes off the same information we got in the last slide. The reflector element is roughly 5% larger than the driven element, and the driven element is roughly one half wavelength on a Yagi antenna. What is the effect of increasing the boom length and adding directors to a Yagi antenna? Well, what you get when you do that is you increase the gain. So as the boom length is increased and additional directors are added to the Yagi antenna, more of the received signals are focused to the driven element 
and thus received by the receiver. So essentially you're getting a stronger signal in the, in the desired direction. So this increase in signal strength by changing the design of the Yagi can also be stated as increasing the antenna's gain. So basically you are increasing the Yagi's gain in a particular direction by increasing the length of the antenna and adding more director elements to the Yagi antenna. So essentially if you think of a Yagi antenna as a lens that focuses a radio signal to the driven element, by increasing the length and in adding director elements, you are essentially increasing the focus of that lens to the driven element and increasing the gain. Which of the following is a reason why a Yagi antenna is often used for radio communications on the 20 meter band? The answer is it helps reduce interference from other stations to the side or behind the antenna. Now this is true whether it's a 20 meter band and a uh, Yagi or 2 meter band or 10 meter band or whatever. A Yagi antenna is a directional antenna and it focuses signal strength from a particular direction. So by doing this it eliminates noise from other directions from the sides and the rear particularly and focuses it in just one direction or making it a directional antenna. Now so you would use this say if you're trying to get um, signals from or focus on signals from Europe. You would basically take your Yagi, point it in the direction of, of Europe and you will focus the signals coming to or coming from Europe and also increase the strength of your signal in the direction of Europe. So like I said th this is the case for all Yagi antennas or all directional antennas for that matter. It basically improves the signal strength in one direction and filters out the stuff to the side and to the rear. What does front to back ratio mean in reference to a Yagi antenna? The answer is the power radiated in the major radiation lobe compared to the power radiated in exactly the opposite direction. So like we were talking about in the previous question, most of the signal strength of a Yagi's radiated signal is in the direction the Yagi is pointed. However, some of the signal does leak out of the back into the sides. Now, the amount of signal radiated in the desired direction as compared to the amount radiating in the exact opposite or behind in the reverse direction of the Yagi is the front to back ratio. So it's kind of a simple explanation. Don't overthink the question. It's simply the amount of energy that's radiated to the rear as compared to that radiated to the front. What is meant by the main lobe of a directive antenna? The answer is the direction of maximum radiated field strength from the antenna. Now if you remember back um, talking about the radiation pattern of a dipole, the lobes of the of dipole antenna form a figure eight pattern at right angles to the antenna. So essentially if you have a dipole that's hung from the north to the south, the energy or the st signal strength primarily goes to the east and the west in a dipole. Now, the radiation pattern of a Yagi, or any directional antenna for that matter, form a very large lobe in the direction the antenna is pointing, showing that the majority of the signal strength is going in that direction. So this main lobe demonstrates that the focus of this energy, or your signal, is going in that, that direction. So that is that direction the Yagi is pointed, creating this huge lobe. That lobe is called the main lobe of the radiation pattern. What is the approximate maximum theoretical forward gain of a three element Yagi antenna? The answer is 9.7 decibels I or dBi. Now this is one you need to memorize. Um, you should be familiar with the, the term decibel as a label in reference to gain. Now what this makes this one different from just a general decibel um, uh, number is, is the I in the dBi. And this means uh, an isotropic antenna, or it, it references an omnidirectional antenna. So what this DBI is, is, is a comparison of the signal strength of a three-element Yagi in its focal direction as compared to the signal strength of an antenna that's radiating equally in all directions. So basically, it's how much you have a, an antenna that's radiating in a 360-degree pattern, and you have a signal strength of that antenna from um, another station. Now if you point the Yagi in the, the direction of that station that's transmitting, the signal strength is going to be higher than the omnidirectional antenna. 
So this 9.7 dBi is roughly how much higher gain that Yagi antenna is going to have over just a general omnidirectional antenna. Which of the following is a Yagi antenna design variable that could be adjusted to optimize forward gain, front to back ratio, or SWR bandwidth? And the answers are the physical length of the boom, the number of elements on the boom, and the spacing of each element along the boom. And yes, this is an all of the above question. So essentially, each one of the possible answers alone will affect at least one of the, the you know, whether it be the gain, the front to back ratio, or the SWR bandwidth. However, all of them affect all three. So basically, one of the possible answers will affect one of those characteristics. However, um, each one won't affect all of them. So this kind of combines some of the other questions we talked about in this section into kind of one summary question. So basically, to optimize forward gain, front to back ratio, and SWR bandwidth, what you're going to, to adjust are the physical length of the boom, the number of elements on the boom, specifically direct, uh, directive elements, and the spacing of each element along the boom. And all three of these answers will impact the gain, the front to back ratio, and SWR bandwidth of a Yagi. What is the purpose of a gamma match used with Yagi antennas? All right, the purpose of a gamma match is to match the relatively low feed point impedance to 50 ohms. So essentially, a gamma match is a type of impedance matching network. Now, there is kind of a trick answer to this question, and what you need to take away from the possible answers on this is that the question is looking for matching the relatively low feed point impedance rather than the relatively high feed point impedance. And what you need to know is that on a Yagi antenna, the feed point impedance is generally lower than 50 ohms. So if most coaxial cable or most feed line used by amateurs is a 50 ohm feed line, you're going to need to find a match for that. And the way you find that match is with a gamma match. So remember that you're looking for the lower, the relatively low feed point impedance and match that to 50 ohms rather than the relatively high feed point impedance and match that to 50 ohms. Which of the following describes a common method for insulating the driven element of a Yagi antenna from the metal boom when using a gamma match? Now this is kind of a weird question in that, that none of these answers are correct and no insulation is needed. And I really don't like this question because it, it really kind of messes with you. Yet yeah, none of the possible answers with the exception of the one that says none of the answers are correct is the correct answer. So if basically the bottom line is that if you're using a gamma match, you do not need to insulate the driven element from the boom. So if you have a metal boom on a Yagi, um, it can be hooked straight into the boom, which provides you know some advantage as far as you don't have less materials, cheaper cost to making the antenna, etc. Um, the gamma match compensates for that, and you don't need to worry about insulating the driven element from the boom. Approximately how long is each side of a cubical quad antenna driven element? The answer is one quarter wavelength. And a quad antenna is the second type of directional antenna we talked about in this section. And if you can picture what a box kite looks like, that's almost exactly what a quad antenna looks like, minus the fabric. And the driven element of a quad antenna has four sides, which add up to a full wavelength. So essentially you have a full wavelength of wire and you basically fold that into a square. You add a reflector element onto that and you have a basic quad antenna. Now, the quad antenna elements kind of fall in the same category as the, the Yagi antenna. You have a, a driven element, a reflector element, and sometimes you can have director elements. And the reflector element is larger than the driven element and the director elements are smaller than the driven element, which is the same relationship as in a Yagi antenna. However, the difference is quads will often just have the driven and reflector elements for the antenna. Some quads will have add uh, director elements in there. However, you do not need them for a basic directional quad antenna. How does the forward gain of a two-element cubical quad antenna compare to the forward gain of a three-element Yagi antenna? So basically what they're asking is they're comparing a basic quad antenna to a basic Yagi antenna. And how, how what's the difference in gain between the two? And the answer is they're about the same. And this is something to memorize. It's a pretty good relation, relationship. So a two-quad, or excuse me, a two-element quad antenna has roughly the same forward gain as a three-element Yagi antenna, so the performance is roughly the same. 
approximately how long is each side of a cubical quad antenna reflector element? The answer is each side is slightly more than a quarter wavelength. And this is the same, you have to think back to the Yagi antenna explanation, it's, it's the same rationale. So the reflector element of a quad antenna is a little bit bigger than the driven element. So each side of a quad's driven element is one quarter wavelength. So for the reflector to be larger than the driven element, it needs to be slightly more than a quarter wavelength on each side. How does the gain of a two element delta loop beam compare to the gain of a two element cubical quad antenna? And the answer again is they're about the same. And you can start to see a trend here. Now the delta loop antenna is the third type of directional antenna we talk about in this section. And you don't need to know any more directional antennas for the exam, um, at least for this section. And a delta loop antenna is a lot like a quad. And except where a quad antenna has, uh, you know, each, each element of a quad antenna has four sides, a delta loop only has three. So it's like a, a, a triangle. It's exactly like a triangle actually. So they're set up pretty much the same as a delta loop antenna where all you need to have for the basic antenna is the driven element and a reflector. And the thing to take away from this question is that a three element Yagi, a two element quad, and a two element delta loop antenna all perform about the same. So delta loop antenna, each element has three sides and is set up pretty much exactly like a quad antenna. Approximately how long is each leg of a symmetrical delta loop antenna driven element? And the answer is approximately one third wavelength. So the total length of a driven element of a delta loop is one wavelength. So it's just like a quad. Is that basically, and so instead of a quad where you take a, a, a wavelength of wire and basically bend it into a square loop, on a delta loop you take a wavelength of wire and bend it into a triangle loop. So each side of the driven element of a delta loop antenna is one third wavelength. Which of the following antenna types consists of a driven element and some combination of parasitic excited reflector and or director elements? The answer is a Yagi antenna and you don't want to overthink this question. So when you see the, this, an, this question on the exam, don't freak out when you see all the other possible answers for the antennas. You don't need to know them for the exam. Just stick with what you've learned for uh, the antenna type that consists of a driven element and some combination of reflector and director elements. All you need to remember for this one is a Yagi antenna. What type of directional antenna is typically constructed from two square loops of wire ha each having a circumference of approximately one wavelength at the operating frequency and separated by approximately 0.2 wavelengths? And the answer is a cubical quad antenna. And it's kind of the same idea as the last question. Don't overthink it. All you need to recognize from this question is two square loops. And the only antenna we've covered that has at least two square loops is the quad antenna. What happens when the feed point of a cubical quad antenna is changed from the center of the lowest horizontal wire to the center of one of the vertical wires? The answer is the polarization of the radiated signal changes from horizontal to vertical. And if you remember when we talked about dipoles and uh, horizontal antennas and vertical antennas, um, how the polarization of the signal on a like a dipole with this horizontal or parallel to the Earth's surface is horizontally polarized, and a vertical antenna, which is perpendicular to the Earth's surface, is vertically polarized. The uh, same relationship will happen with a quad antenna, however, you can change it relatively easily. And th this is actually kind of neat. So basically, if you take the feed point of the driven element of a quad antenna from the bottom of the antenna and move it to the side of the antenna, you would change the antenna from a horizontally polarized antenna to a vertically polarized antenna, which gives you all sorts of different propagation capabilities and a bunch of other stuff depending on how far you're trying to propagate and whether you're using VHF, HF, or whatever. So this is actually a pretty neat idea. So if the driven element, the feed point is at the bottom in the center of the, the square loop, you have a horizontally polarized antenna. If you move it to the center of one of the sides of the, the square loop, you have a vertically polarized antenna. What configuration of the loops of a cubical quad antenna must be used for the antenna to operate as a beam antenna, assuming one of the elements is used as a reflector? 
All right, the reflector element must be approximately 5% longer than the driven element. And this is one you got to think about a little bit. It's the same mentality as the Aggie. Is the reflector element of a quad antenna is roughly 5% longer than the driven element. So when they're talking about what configuration of loops and a cubicle quad antenna must be used for the antenna to operate as a beam antenna, you know that you need to have at least a driven element and a reflector element. And that reflector element is roughly a total of 5% longer than the driven element. And that's the end of the review, and it is time for the G9C quiz. So take out a pencil and a piece of paper and number 1 through 21. And I'm going to go through the questions pretty quickly, so if you need more time, just pause the video, take all the time you need. And once you're done with the video, or the quiz rather, you can go to hamwhisper.com and check your answers under the exam answers page. You can find the answers under the G9C section of questions. And with that said, let's get started with the quiz. Question 1. How can the SWR bandwidth of a Yagi antenna be increased? A. Use larger diameter elements. B. Use closer element spacing. C. Use traps on the elements. Or D. Use tapered diameter elements. Question 2. What is the approximate length of the driven element of a Yagi antenna? A, one quarter wavelength, B, one half wavelength, C, three quarter wavelength, or D, one wavelength? Question three. Which statement about a three element single band Yagi antenna is true? A, the reflector is normally the shortest parasitic element. B, the director is normally the shortest parasitic element. C, the driven element is the longest parasitic element or D, low feed point impedance increases bandwidth. Question four, which statement about a Yagi antenna is true? A, the reflector is normally the longest parasitic element. B, the director is normally the longest parasitic element. C, the reflector is normally the shortest parasitic element. Or D, all the elements must be the same length. Question five, what is one effect of increasing the boom length and adding directors to a Yagi antenna? A. Gain increases. B. SWR increases. C. Weight decreases. Or D. Wind load decreases. Question 6. Which of the following is a reason why a Yagi antenna is often used for radio communications on the 20 meter band? A. It provides excellent omnidirectional coverage in the horizontal plane. B. It is smaller, less expensive, and easier to erect than a dipole or vertical antenna. C. It helps reduce interference from other stations to the side or behind the antenna. Or D. It provides the highest possible angle of radiation for the HF bands. Question 7. What does front to back ratio mean in reference to a Yagi antenna? A. The number of directors versus the number of reflectors. B. The relative position of the driven element with respect to the reflectors and directors. C. The power radiated in the major radiation lobe compared to the power radiated in exactly the opposite direction. Or D. The ratio of forward gain to dipole gain. Question 8. What is meant by the main lobe of a directive antenna? A. The magnitude of the maximum vertical angle of radiation. B. The point of maximum current in a radiating antenna element. C. The maximum voltage standing wave point on a radiating element or D, the direction of maximum radiated field strength from the antenna. Question 9. What is the approximate maximum theoretical forward gain of a three-element Yagi antenna? A, 9.7 decibels I, B, 7.3 decibels D, C, 5.4 times the gain of a dipole, or D, all of these choices are correct. Question 10. Which of the following is a Yagi antenna design variable that could be adjusted to optimize forward gain, front-to-back ratio, or SWR bandwidth? A, the physical length of the boom. B, the number of elements on the boom. C, the spacing of each element along the boom. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Question 11. What is the purpose of a gamma match used with Yagi antennas? A, to match the relatively low feed point impedance to 50 ohms. B, to match the relatively high feed point impedance to 50 ohms. C, to increase the front to back ratio. Or D, to increase the main lobe gain. Question 12. 
Which of the following describes a common method for insulating the driven element of a Yagi antenna from the metal boom when using a gamma match? A. To support the driven element with ceramic standoff insulators. B. Insert a high impedance transformer at the driven element. C. Insert a high voltage balloon at the driven element. Or D. None of these answers are correct. No insulation is needed. Question 13. Approximately how long is each side of a cubical quad antenna driven element? A, a quarter wavelength, B, one half wavelength, C, three quarter wavelength, or D, one wavelength. Question 14. How does the forward gain of a two element cubical quad antenna compare to the forward gain of a three element Yagi antenna? A, two thirds, B, about the same, C, three halves, or D, twice? Question 15. Approximately how long is each side of a cubical quad antenna reflector element? A. Slightly less than one quarter wavelength. B. Slightly more than one quarter wavelength. C. Slightly less than one half wavelength. Or D. Slightly more than one half wavelength. Question 16. How does the gain of a two element delta loop compare to the gain of a two element cubical quad antenna? A. Three decibels higher. B. Three decibels lower. C. 2.54 decibels higher, or D, about the same. Question 17. Approximately how long is each leg of a symmetrical delta loop antenna driven element? A, one quarter wavelength, B, one third wavelength, C, one half wavelength, or D, two thirds wavelengths. Question 18. Which of the following antenna types consists of a driven element in some combination of parasitically excited reflector and or director elements? A, a collinear array, B, a rhombic antenna, C, a double extended ZEP antenna, or D, a Yagi antenna. Question 19. What type of directional antenna is typically constructed from two square loops of wire, each having a circumference of approximately one wavelength at the operating frequency and separated by approximately 0.2 wavelengths? A, a stacked dipole array, B, a collinear array, C, a cubical quad antenna, or D, an adcock array. Question 20. What happens when the feed point of a cubical quad antenna is changed from the center of the lowest horizontal wire to the center of one of the vertical wires? A, the polarization of the radiated signal changes from horizontal to vertical. B, the polarization of the radiated signals changes from vertical to horizontal. C, the direction of the main lobe is reversed or D, the radiated signal changes to an omnidirectional pattern. And question 21. What configuration of the loops of a cubical quad antenna must be used for the antenna to operate as a beam antenna, assuming one of the elements is used as a reflector? A, the driven element must be fed with a balloon transformer. C, the driven element must be open circuited on the side opposite the feed point. C, the reflector element must be approximately 5% shorter than the driven element. Or D, the reflector element must be approximately 5% longer than the driven element. And that is it for Lesson 32 and the G9C section of questions, and it was a long one. So now that you're done with the quiz, go to hamwhisper.com, check your answers. You can find them under the G9C section of questions under the exam answers page. So until next time in Lesson 33, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.